I grew up in a um, small town in North Louisiana called Columbia, Louisiana, and I lived on a farm. And about five miles from us, uh, we had some neighbors uh, that had a good number of children, and one of those children was my age, and we went to school together. And, um, and her dad went on to become the governor of the state of Louisiana. And so, when we were in the second grade, she and her family, they moved to Baton Rouge, the capital of Louisiana, and moved into the governor's mansion. And so, uh, because we were friends, I was given the toll-free number. You could call long distance for free at that time. That was an amazing thing. I thought I was high cotton. Uh, a couple of times when I was early teens, I uh, got to go down to Baton Rouge and actually go to an LSU football game with the governor and get in the limousines and police escorts and went down and dropped us off at the front of the stadium, sat on the 50-yard line, uh, had a police escort home. That, I, was, I, was, I was flying high. Well, after eight years, they uh, moved back to a hometown, and uh, she came back to school. We continued to be friends, and she was a wonderful Christian. And so um, one day, uh, they didn't go to our church, but one day I'm sitting in church on Sunday evening, and I could see whispers sort of going through the congregation. And finally, someone whispered to me and said, the governor's house is on fire. My friend's house is on fire. So I slipped out of the service and I drove to their home. And when I got there, their house is just engulfed in flames. And they're standing, the family is standing in the front yard just watching it. And I walked up and stood there in silence with them. Others from the community began to trickle in and Soon there, there must have been 50 people standing in the yard, everybody in silence, because what do you say? The house just totally engulfed. As I was standing there, I was thinking about how many times I had been in their home. And their home was filled with memorabilia of the times that he, you know, during his time of being a governor, he had pictures all over the house of him with you know, high-ranking government officials, dignitaries from, you know, foreign dignitaries. There were plaques and there were awards and there were presents and there were expensive gifts and there were just all these personalized things that had been given, achievements that he had done, recognition for accomplishments that he had. And the, half the house was like a, a trophy case of just all this stuff that symbolized his accomplishments. And now we're sitting there and we're watching all of this just go up in flames. Irreplaceable. Incredible loss. We were just standing there in silence. What do you, what do you say? The Bible says that God's children are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And if what you've given your life to achieve and accomplish has not been what God wanted for your life, but rather you've focused on the accumulation of the things of this world and you've focused on life here in this world and rather than focusing on the kingdom of God, the Bible says that one day everything you gave your life to that is not centered in Christ is going to go up in flames. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because that day, the day of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what he has built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. But yet we'll be saved. They'll make it to heaven. But everything they gave their life to apart from Jesus 
gets burned up. Even though they're saved, it will be as one escaping through the flames. Can you imagine living your life, devoting your time, your talents, your resources to the things of this life rather than God's plan for your life? It's important that you take this time that you have in your life. We all get one shot at this, and it's fleeting. Life is passing quickly. And you get one chance to live for Jesus. You get one chance to make your life count for the kingdom, to do the will of God, to invest your life now by faith in that which will last for eternity rather than getting all caught up in the rat race of this world. It is so easy to just get so busy and so stressed and so consumed with all the demands of this life that we, we can easily begin to think, well, you know, I'm just in a season of my life right now when I don't have time to prioritize what God wants me to do in serving the Lord. But, you know, I'll, I'll get around to that later. And there's some maybe sitting here or some watching right now that all during your early years of your life, you kept thinking when you got older, you'd serve the Lord. But now you're older and you're still not totally serving the Lord with your life. Now you get to be older and sometimes the temptations go, well, you know what? I'm, I've, I've worked hard. Now it's time to throttle back a little bit. It's time to, to do what I want to do now. And, and it's just very easy to just, next thing you know, your life is gone And what did you do with your life of eternal significance? Jesus Christ loves you. He saved you. If you're a child of God, he died for you. He saved you. He gifted you. He has a purpose for your life. And when you and I pursue that purpose, then we are going to be eternally rewarded. An amazing thing. I mean, Jesus has done so much for you and me that if we just spent the rest of our life living full out for him and, and he give, gave no rewards, well, that would be the least that we could do, right? I mean, he's worthy of that. But then an amazing thing is he says, if you serve me and do what I ask you to do, I'm going to reward you forever for that, forever. But many of us are preoccupied with trying to achieve so much in this world that we don't have time for what God wants us to do. I remember when I was about 21 years old, I became pastor of my first church and it was in my hometown. And, and um, so after one year there, I moved to Dallas and began to go to Bible school here, but I continued to pastor the church on weekends. So I would fly from Dallas to um, Monroe, Louisiana, and I would fly over there on Friday evenings. I would um, often go out and meet with our young people, and then we'd have Saturday and Sunday, and then all day Monday, and I would fly out on Monday nights, and I'd come back to Dallas, go to school Tuesday through Friday. So I did that for three and a half years, and... um, one Monday night, I'm flying back into town. I had a roommate, had an apartment here in Dallas, had a roommate, a guy that I'd known for a couple of years. And he was out of town that weekend. Of course, I was out of town as normal. And when I get back, I walk up to the door of our apartment and I notice that the door is open, the doorknob's broken, and someone has kicked in the door and they've gone in and they've robbed our apartment, taken everything that was of any value. Now, don't misunderstand, I didn't have a whole lot of value, but, but what was there, they got our TV, our stereo system, you know, some other things, some money that I'd had in a drawer that I was saving and some just different stuff. And, um, and as I'm standing in that apartment looking at everything's been ransacked and turned upside down and, you know, just, you know, rummaged through. And I'm standing there and a verse of scripture pops in my mind, found in Matthew chapter six, verse 19, Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The accumulation of this world, when you stand before Jesus one day, it's really not going to matter the size of the house you lived in, the kind of car you drove, how many diplomas you had on the wall, how many titles you had beside your name, how much money you had in the bank. It's really not going to matter. What's going to matter is did you use your life? Did you use your time? Did you use your talents? Did you use the financial resources God gave you to focus on doing what God wanted you to do? It's only those things that are going to last. Imagine that you were playing Monopoly. I mean, most of us here have played the game of Monopoly. Monopoly, you're in this game, you're taking money, just paper. It's not really worth anything. It's just, it's only worth something in the game. So you take that and you're buying real estate and you're playing this game. You're trying to accumulate all you can because the person who has the most at the end wins. But imagine when the game is over that everybody gets up to go on with your life, but there's another person there that, that says, you know, they're just fixated on how much money they've got there, how much monopoly money they've got. And so they're neglecting. They won't go to the job the next day. They won't take care of their, their life and their families and whatever because they're, they're focused on managing the properties on the monopoly board. And you're going, how foolish would that be? This is not worth anything except when you're in the game, right? It's worthless out here. Well, right now we're living in this game of life that we have that's only going to last a few years. And everything we achieve, all the real estate, all the money, all the things we've got, it's really just monopoly money when you compare it to eternity. Because it's not going to be worth anything up there. The only thing that's worth something up there is if you took the monopoly money you got right now and you invested it in God's kingdom. You did what God wanted you to do. You spent your time, your talents, and your resources obeying the will of God for your life. Then when you do that, you're laying up true riches in heaven, the Bible says, treasures in heaven that you will have for eternity that will really be valuable. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and it was a thank you letter because they had given an offering to him because he was in jail. The Apostle Paul was in jail in Rome, and he wrote the letter of Philippians and to the Philippian church. And he writes in Philippians 4.10, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I've learned to be content in whatever my circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to be, to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles, to send me this, the money that you did. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when you first gave your lives to Jesus, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you, you only. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Now, don't get me wrong. Not that I desire a gift because I've learned how to be content whether I've got anything or not. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Paul knew that what the Philippians gave to him, he's doing the work of God. And he knew that when they gave to him, they were partnering with him 
in this ministry, and they were going to get credit, and they were going to get rewarded for whatever God did through Paul's life. So he said, what I really desire for you is that you will have great reward. So I'm not asking you, to, I'm not bragging on you for giving to me because I'm somehow subtly hoping you'll send more. I, I've got everything I need. But I do want you to invest in eternity. I want you to use your life and use your resources for things that will last forever. Now, Paul was talking to a really poor group of people. The reason we know that is because a few years before this, in fact, the very reason Paul is in jail is because Paul had been starting all these churches, these Gentile churches, and there was sort of division in the church in those days between the Jewish believers who were primarily in, in Jerusalem and in that surrounding area, and then the Gentile believers around the world. Because prior to the, to the Christ coming, there was great animosity between the Jews and Gentiles. And now they all get saved. They're in the same body of Christ, but they've got these old habits and old prejudices that still they're fighting through. So Paul wanted to do something to help that. So Paul went to the Gentile churches and he knew the believers in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers were much, they were struggling financially under great uh, persecution, great poverty. So he goes to these Gentile churches and he asked them for an offering that he and some others can take to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Not only would it meet their needs, but it would let them know the Gentile churches and believers loved them and appreciated them. And it would bring about love and unity among themselves. It would help the Gentiles to recognize how important the Jews were because if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have the gospel. So it would bring unity to the church. So Paul was going around collecting this offering. But what happened was in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is in the middle of taking this offering, but he writes to them, to, the, to these brothers and sisters, and he says, now brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. In the midst of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testify they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. This was their initiative. They, look, get this, they're, they're poor, but they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then to us by the will of God also. You know, Paul was, Paul was sitting there thinking, I don't want to burden these folks. They've got so much on their plate. They've got their own troubles. They're, they don't have much money, and so I'm not even going to ask them to join in this offering. And, but they somehow heard about it, and they started going, Paul, we want to participate in this. We want to give to this. And Paul must have kept going, no, you know, really? You, and, they, and they pleaded with him for the privilege of sharing in this offering. Why? Well, Paul had, had taught them that when you when you do that, you're investing in eternity. I told you about three weeks ago, I had the privilege of going back to my hometown and preaching in my home church for a homecoming celebration. It was a celebration of their 120 year anniversary as a church. And that church, as I was preparing for that, I was thinking about the history of the church. That church started 120 years ago in the home of my great-great-grandfather. I didn't know him, but I've heard about him through the years. And I don't know anything about the story except there was no Baptist work in the area and my great-great-grandfather and some others decided to meet together and start a church. Now, I don't know anything about it, but I know this. I know the devil had to have opposed it. And I know whatever it was they were doing had to take faith. And I know they probably were scared and they didn't know what to do. And they had all these reasons why that, you know. But they started, a handful of them started. 
I doubt that any of them sitting in, there, in that home when they started that church, I doubt any of them had any idea that 120 years later, that church would still be preaching Jesus, still be reaching out to the community, winning souls to Christ, discipling people, giving to missions, touching people around the world. And that little group in that home is still getting credit for every bit of that. You know, one of the reasons why that when a Christian dies and we go to be with the Lord, the judgment seat of Christ doesn't happen then. And the reason for that is because when a believer dies, their works don't die. You see, that, that group that was started that church at First Baptist Columbia 120 years ago, they're all with the Lord now. But their work's still working. What they did still earning eternal treasures for them. If you could interview any of them today, they're up there and, and every, every day, every week, what they did with their life is still going on and still earning eternal rewards for them. If you ask them, do you regret that investment of your time, your talent, your gifts? <laughs> you know they would not. But I suspect that there were a lot of believers who had, were asked to join that group who for whatever reason didn't do it. And they're with the Lord now, but they probably think, man, did I miss out on a great investment. Paul says to the Philippian church, when you give, it's a blessing to me and I, I'm grateful for it. But what I'm really excited about is the fact that it really brings fruit or it brings credit to your account. In chapter one of this book, Paul says to them in Philippians chapter one, he says that all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. Paul says, you're partners with me in what we're doing here. Paul goes on later in this chapter, and he's, he wants them to know what's going on with him because Paul has actually been in prison now for several years. When he took that offering that the Philippians and the other Gentile churches gave to him, and he and some other believers took the offering to Jerusalem, when they got there, they gave the offerings to the church who appreciated it. Then Paul went to the temple and when he got there, some of the Jewish unbelievers who were in Judaism, they saw Paul there and they, made, they lied about him and they said he came here to desecrate the temple and a mob started to, they were going to kill him and he was rescued by the Roman soldiers and they finally take him to Caesarea, which is north of there, and he stays in jail in Caesarea for two years over an innocent man, he took this offering and he got arrested. He's in jail for two years in Caesarea, during which time the Philippians didn't have opportunity to, to help him in any way. At the end of two years, he finally says, look, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And they said, okay. And they put him on a ship and sailed to Rome where he was under house arrest in Rome and he was in prison there for another couple of years. And it's during that time he's in prison in Rome, now three or four years in prison, the Philippians have just now have the opportunity to re-engage and help him again. And he writes to them and he says in verse 12 of chapter one, now I want you to know brothers and sisters is what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Jesus. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters here in Rome have become confident in the Lord and are dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. They become more bold in their witness. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, others out of goodwill. The latter, those out of goodwill, they do it out of love, knowing I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. But those who have rivalry in their heart they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, 
supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. What does it matter? The important thing is in every way, whether their false motives are true, Christ is preached, and with that I rejoice. Because of this, I will continue to rejoice. So Paul says to them, I don't want you to think just because I'm in jail that what you've given is not advancing the gospel and partnering and making a difference. He said, God is going to bless you forever for this. And I thank God for your partnership. Whenever we serve the Lord with our lives, we teach that class, we work with the children, we, we greet when people come in and we share the love of Jesus. We, we share hospitality with people. The word hospitality means lover of strangers. So when people come and they're, they're new to the church and we've got people who greet them in the parking lot or in the, in the, the hub and and, and say welcome in, in, in the name of Jesus and love people and make them feel welcome. That is serving Jesus. And whatever it is that God wants you to do, when you, when you serve, when you give, when you seek the Lord, God uses it in an incredible way. Do you know that every time you give an offering to this church and it goes just to the general fund of the church, do you know that every time you do that, you invest in every single ministry that's happening in this church? That means that today, if you've given your offerings today, then it's like you're out there in the, in the preschool area loving on those children. And you're in the elementary classroom today teaching those children about Jesus. And you were in the youth ministries this morning and all the adult classes and all the ministries that go on, our academy during the week, over 200 kids learning about Jesus all day long. Our, our outreach to the high schools and middle schools and others in the area, you're part of every bit of that. All the missionaries that our church supports, all the missions literally around the world, you are, it's like you are there doing that work. I can't think of anything better to invest your money in that's going to last forever than giving your offerings to the Lord. Through the years, God has given our church an amazing opportunity to invest in so many things that, that, are, that many of which we've almost forgotten about, and yet God is still using it and still going on and the dear saints who invested in that are going to stand before Jesus one day. And Jesus is going to say, let me show you what I did. And you're going to just be astounded. I think years ago, hadn't been at the church very long, there was a, there was a, a man that I knew who had been a pastor in South Louisiana, had a massive heart attack. His heart attack was so bad, it almost killed him. He was in the hospital, tubes running all out his body, and so weak he couldn't stand up. The doctor came in and said, you can't take the strain and stress of the pastorate anymore. You're going you're gonna to have to resign. Well, this man, his name was Joe. When Joe was laying in that hospital bed, he said for years he knew God wanted him to be a missionary to Mexico, but he kept saying no. As he's laying there on that bed, he said, God, if you get me out of this bed, I'll go. He said one week later, he had resigned his church and in a weakened condition, moved his family to the border in South Texas. He didn't speak Spanish. He didn't have any money. He had no support. He didn't have an organization. All he had was God told him to go and he went. So in order to begin to try to minister to people, he just started going to grocery stores and getting day old bread and going out and feeding the hungry. He couldn't speak the language, so he couldn't tell them about Jesus. So what he did was he decided he would get a gospel movie that was in Spanish, and he would take this a projector and a power plant out to these poor areas, and he would hang up this sheet, and he would feed these people and turn on this movie. And they would hear about Jesus in their own language, and many of them would give their lives to Christ. So he started taking some, some Spanish-speaking pastors with him so that when people gave their lives to Christ, they could start a, a church or start discipleship groups. And, and so he started doing this. And next thing you know, he started doing it in the little outback villages of Mexico. And he started going in these little villages and he would find a, a pastor there or an evangelist, somebody trying to reach their people, and nobody in that village would have anything to do with them. 
And this man, Joe, would give him a power plant and give him a, a projector. They'd hang up a sheet and the whole village would show up to watch this movie. That was their entertainment. And many of them would get saved. They did that village after village after village, state after state. He got more and more associates. Next thing you know, he's covering every state in Mexico. Then he went through every Central American country. And then he went to the Philippines. And our church, he had almost no support. Our church was his main supporter for 12 years. For 12 years, we partnered with him and all of his associates. And during that 12 years, one million people came to faith, public professions of faith in Jesus Christ. And we got to partner with that. And many of those people, none of whom I've ever met, are still serving Christ. Some of them are still working and they're investing in the kingdom of God. And all that's going on through all of that, this church and the saints that were here then investing in that. When we stand before Jesus one day, can you imagine what a great investment? Three years ago, I met a, a man from Pakistan who was, had a ministry in Pakistan. His name Dr. Falak Shur. He started visiting our church, and, and it was shortly thereafter the pandemic hit, and the church stopped meeting in person for a while. And, um, and, but I, I met with Flack several times during this several-month period, and to my amazement, he had a ministry in Pakistan. Pakistan is 97% Islamic country, 241 million people, fifth most populous country in the world, the number one populated Muslim country in the world, the most populous Muslim Islamic country, uh, country in the world. And Flack had had a ministry there for 40 years and had a church there and, and numbers of daughter churches off of that church, but they had no place to meet. They were meeting in a tent and they had to rent this tent. So our church started helping him by renting the tent for him. One day I'm meeting with him and I said, Flack is a little older than me. <clears throat> and one day we're talking and I said, what's the dream that God has birthed in your heart? I mean, if you could just, if you could do anything and accomplish anything before the Lord takes you home, what would it be? And he smiled real big and he said, I want to build a church building for our people. He said, we, we need a place where our church can meet where we could have a Bible school to train these pastors, where we could have a Christian school for the children to come and learn about Jesus and, and be educated. And, I, and he said, and we're working on it. He said, six years ago, he said, we bought some cows and we milk those cows and we sell the milk and the cheese and butter. And he said, we've been able to save $6,000. $6,000 in six years. So I real quick thought, okay, it's cost $75,000 is what it was going to cost to build this building. So in 69 years at this rate, they'll get this done. <clears throat> and I just thought, I think we could do that. But we're in the middle of a pandemic. So like Paul didn't want to burden the Philippian church, I didn't know, I didn't want to burden you. And I, I you know, I, I don't know what you, you were going through, and, and so I hesitated. But finally, I just felt like God was in it. I thought, you know, let's give them the opportunity, and if we raise $5,000, that's better than nothing. We'll see. So I stood up on this stage, looked into the camera, nobody out here. I'm talking to the camera. I don't even know if anybody's out there watching. And I shared that vision of reaching people of Pakistan, $75,000. And in three weeks' time, God used you to do what we've taken them 75 years to do. That's not amazing. Today, there's a building there in Shikapura. Shikapura is a city of about 600,000 people. And this is the biggest building in town. And they, today, they will, or this weekend, they will have 1,000 believers come through in five services in that building that you built. 
And off of this mother church, there are 65 daughter churches that meet in a radius of 100 miles of this building. And once a month, all of those churches come in and they have a joint service at the mother church for the weekend. They have a Bible school that meets at night there where they're training 100 pastors in the middle, in the heart of the most populous Islamic world, nation of the world, there's a light shining in the darkness. They graduate their first group in May. Ten of them have already committed to go to Dubai and begin a church in Dubai with the plan that five years later, they'll start a church in Saudi Arabia. These men are willing to die for Christ. They're persecuted. And we are part of that. The Bible school is taught by, on Zoom by professors from Dallas Theological Seminary. It's pretty amazing. And you get, we, we get to be a part of that. We're, we're a part of everything they're doing over there. I get pictures. I wish I could show them to you. I got all these pictures that he sends me every week of Bible, children and Bible studies. And, and we're a part of that. Everything that's done because we invested in that. I'm so glad we did. I'm so glad when we stand before the Lord one day that we, we took that opportunity to invest in eternity. Before we go today, I want to, I want to tell you that God's opened another opportunity for us. I want to tell you about today. And that is that when Falak started this ministry in, in this church and he told me about it, he said, if we could get a building, he said that we could have a Christian school for the children. You see, all the schools there are Islamic schools. So if a Christian has children and they want their kids to have any education, they have to send them to an Islamic school. So most of the Christians won't do that, so their children are uneducated. And as a result of that, they can't get good jobs. They can't better themselves. They live in constant poverty. In fact, the people of the church are so poor, mostly because they're Christians, They're so poor that they can't even support themselves. You do that every month. You send them through this church $1,200 every month, and that pays the salaries of their staff, enables them to do the ministries that they do. And the church can't support itself because the people are poor. But Falag said if we we could start a Christian school, He said, then these families, these children could be educated and they could break out of this cycle of poverty they're in. And then they could begin to, maybe as they grow up and get better jobs, they could help the work of God in Pakistan be more self-supporting. And if we could start this school, he said, then the tuition that the families pay for the kids to go to school, it will support not only the school, but it will support the church and help the church, just like our academy helps support this church. And so I said to Flack, well, how much would it cost to get that school started? He said it would be $36,000. $32,000 to get the school up and going. He said, but we need $4,000 to paint the building. If you see pictures of the building, it's just concrete. He said, so to paint it would be $4,000. So he said that $36,000 $36,000 would paint the building. It would buy the chairs, the tables, the desk, or whatever they need to buy, the marker boards for the walls, supplies for the teachers and different things. It would hire the staff, the teachers they need, and it would buy a van, a used van, so they can go pick the teachers up and bring them to the start of school every day. Because if the teachers aren't there on time, they can't start the school on time. And if they have to walk miles to get there, then it, he said it just creates chaos, so they need a van. So they need $36,000 to get this school up and going. And once it gets up and going before too long, they, it should be self-supporting at that point and then helping the church too. So I've, um, I've known about this for, um, for months, but I've been hesitant to say anything about it. Just like Paul didn't want to burden the Philippian church, I, I, I know we ask a lot of you. We ask you to give to the church. We ask you to give to our new building program that we've got going. Now to add something else on top of that, I just hesitated. And I didn't want to do that. I wasn't sure. 
I've prayed about it, thought about it, mulled over it, talked to our deacons about it a couple of times. <laughs> so last month, we're sitting in the deacons meeting, and the deacons basically looked at me and said, what are we waiting on? So we talked about it, and so I met with Flack and talked about what's still the need and whatever. And so then I wrote to our deacons a couple of weeks ago or less, and I just said, here's, I think we ought to do it. Here's what would happen if we do. Here's what the money would go for. I want you to pray about this. And then I want you to let me know if you sense this is the Lord. But I don't want you to tell me because I don't want you to feel pressure. I want you to tell chair of our deacons and let him tell me what you all think. And, and so within a day or two, chair of our deacons, Robert Camp said, go for it. Said all the, all the guys think God is in this. So this comes to you today from the leaders of our church who sense God's saying, here's an opportunity. And so I'm just asking you today to consider one day out there at the judgment seat of Christ, is this an investment you will have wanted to make? Is this something that will, if the Lord tarries, it will be living on long after we're gone? It'd be nice to invest in something that's going to be eternal, that will live forever. So consider it. I want you to bow your heads. The really important question here today is not whether you give to this offering or not. The really important question is, are you investing in eternity with your life? Or have you so gotten caught up with all the rat race of this world that you've sort of put serving God as secondary in your life? Just remember everything here that's not done for Christ, not done for Christ, not done at the leadership of Christ, not done because he wants you to do it. Everything that we're not doing for Jesus gets burned up. Now that doesn't mean that your job is any important. If Jesus has given you that job, then you go and represent him well there. Then you get eternal rewards for that. Your home taking care of the children that God has given you and pointing them to Jesus and loving them. Jesus is pleased with that. That will be eternally rewarded. I'm talking about when our priorities are wrong and we're pursuing our own desires instead of his. Then all of that gets burned up. Only what's done for Christ will last. Are you living for Jesus? Live for Jesus. You get one shot at this. Make it count. Make it count. Maybe you're here today or you're watching right now and, and you've never, never, ever really come to know God. You, you, you know, you may believe in God, but he just seems distant and you're not connected to him. The Bible says that, that everyone in the, in the world, that we've all disobeyed God, we've all sinned. And that word sin or disobedience to God, the Bible says there's consequences for that. The consequences are separation from God. The Bible describes it this way, the wages, what you get paid, the wages of sin is death. It means spiritual death. Separation cut off from the life of God. What we earn for our sin is separation from God and there's nothing we can do to change that. We can't get reconnected to God. There's nothing we can do to remove that barrier. But God, amazingly, God loves you. And God wants you to be in his family. He wants to connect to you and he wants you to live with him forever. So God himself sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus came and died on the cross to pay the wages, to pay the consequences of your sin. And while Jesus was on the cross, God took my sin and your sin and the sins of the whole world and nailed it to the cross with Jesus. And Jesus was judged for our sins as though he himself had committed them. And when he was getting ready to die, he cried out, 
and he said, it's finished. In the language he was speaking, that meant paid in full. Your sin debt paid in full. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. And when God raised him from the dead, it was God declaring that I've accepted the payment. It was enough. And now Jesus is the Savior, the only one who can reconnect you to God. And so God gives us promises in his word. And God says the wages of your sin is death and separation. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God, it's a gift. You can't earn it, you can't deserve it, it's a gift. And God offers you the gift of his son today. He offers you his son. And the Bible says that the way you receive him is you call upon him. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. You call on him by asking him, just praying. See, Jesus wants to save you, but he won't make you do it. He's waiting on you to invite him. So if you'd like to do that, just pray something like this. Just pray, Lord Jesus, I know my sins have separated me from God. And there's nothing I can do to save myself. But I believe you died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. And I believe you rose from the dead and you promised that if I would call upon you, that you would save me, rescue me from my sins. So I'm calling right now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and my life and save me and make me your child. Give me eternal life, a relationship with God. Thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. Something amazing just happened to you. It is so incredible. You're going to spend the rest of your life learning about it and the rest of your eternity rejoicing about it. So we just are so happy for you. And now that you've become a brand new person in Christ, you're, all your sins have been forgiven, brand new beginning in life. Now what do you do? Well, that's the purpose of a church is to help you know what to do next. And we'd love to be a partner with you. So if you prayed that prayer with me today, would you take the gray card that's in the seat back in front of you? If you'll fill that out, check the box that says, I prayed today to ask Jesus to save me from my sins. When you walk out today, just drop the card in one of the offering boxes on the side. And if you do that, we'll contact you this week and just see if we could just talk to you a minute and just celebrate with you and say, here's some, some tips on what you begin to do now. We'd love to do that. If you'd like to join our church, just take the gray card, check the box that says, I want to pursue membership of the church. If you want to be baptized, check that box, turn them in. We'd love to have that record of your visit. If, you, um, if you're our guest here today, thank you so much for coming. I hope you felt welcome when you came in today. I hope you heard from God today. I hope that you will come back. And uh, we, we wanted to be a blessing to you. So if you wouldn't mind, if you're our guest, if you wouldn't mind taking the blue card that's in the seat back in front of you, just take 10 seconds to fill it out. And if you would drop it on the, if you go to the back tables, we have tables in the back, we have a gift for you. The gift is a book by Dr. Charles Stanley on really how to hear from God through the scriptures. How when you're reading the Bible, how do you get God to speak to you? We have that book. It'd be our investment in your life. We'd love for you to have one. So if you'll take the blue card, fill it out, just put it on the back table, pick up one of those books. We would love uh, to have that uh, in your hands. So I hope that you'll do that. Well, thank you so very much for being here. As we get ready to go, I just want to invite you back next week. For the next three Sundays, I'm going to be speaking on a sermon series we've entitled Toxic. And what that's about is that every one of us have had people in our lives that are just not good for us. People that, you know, we try to be patient with them, we try to help them, and no matter what you do, it doesn't make any difference. They won't, they won't ever change. They, they just pull you down. They're always wanting something more, just a bad, difficult situation. But as a believer who 
wants to be like Jesus, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? Can you ever say no and be a loving Christian? Can you, can you ever? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And I think you're going to be amazed as we look at Jesus and we see how Jesus dealt with folks like that. And I hope you'll come. I think you, most of us here, probably could benefit from that. And I hope you'll tell somebody that you know that might be in a situation that, where they need some biblical help. So next week, we'll start that series for three weeks. I hope you'll come back. So let's stand together. Don't forget to give your offerings to the Lord today as you go. You can put your offerings in the offering box or you can give online. If you'd like to give to the church in Pakistan or the and give to the school there, you can do that online. Just go online and uh, just get to the, the giving page and just hit the little drop down menu and you'll see their church of Pakistan and everything you designate there will go to that, to that eternal investment. So let's pray together. I thank you, God, for what you have done for us as a church. Thank you for this amazing opportunity that you give us to partner with you and what you're doing in the world. Lord, help us all to make our life count for you. I, I desire so much for your people here to be richly rewarded when they stand before you one day. I pray that for all eternity, they would reap the rewards of a life lived for Christ. Lord, I pray your blessings on them. Your blessings on our brothers and sisters in Pakistan today serving you. Lord, would you provide, this is something you want done. So would you provide in whatever way you want to do that. And we give you the glory and the praise and thank you for that. Lord, we, we pray today as we close, we pray for the nation of Israel. We know the horrendous events that have taken place there the last two days. Over 600 people that we know of have been killed thousands wounded, and they're probably all of that growing by the hour. And Lord, there's innocent people on both sides of that conflict, the Jewish people, the Palestinian people. There are people that are caught in the middle of all of that, and they had nothing to do with it. And God, they are scared. They're suffering. And I just ask, we ask you, God, to just reveal yourself to them. Would you, in the middle of this incredible conflict and suffering, would you show both those who are Jewish and those who are Muslim, would you show them that Jesus is the answer? Would you be with our Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters there as they hold forth the light of the gospel? Give them wisdom, give them courage and boldness. And as you told us to do in your word, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Put your hand over that conflict and guide and, oh Lord, bring about your eternal purposes. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming.